when I was more involved in conspiracy theory, the reason I, I, I still believe in conspiracy theories, but I got very, very deeply involved. I noticed I could track over a period of time that there were some mental health issues that were coming up the longer I stayed on forums, watched the YouTube videos, read the books that went with it. I mean, I went quite deep into some uh, theories, but it had a negative effect on <coughs> mental health over time. Um, and eventually I pulled out, I was like, okay, this might be true, it might not be true, but I know that me looking at this is not helping. So I'm, I'm gonna pull out and things improve for me. Um, do you have any idea why it might have had that kind of effect? On me over time. I think I think conspiracy theories, uh, the best of them, compromise the reality test. Mm. They um, they offer you a deal. We will minimize your anxiety, but you will give up reality. It's not acceptable to you. And most conspiracy theories answer yes. Mm. Most normal people, I mean, not non-conspiracy theories, <laughs> answer no. Mm -hmm. the, the overwhelming problem, uh, the overwhelming uh, service of conspiracy, overwhelming function of conspiracy theories, is actually anxiety reduction. It's not about paranoia. It's not about uh, even about regulating the sense of self-worth, which are the classic theories mm. of the psychology of conspiracy theory. Okay. Uh, one theory says that conspiracy theories are paranoid, mm -hmm. and another theory says that conspiracy theories regulate the their sense of self-worth and self-esteem, uh, self-confidence. Mm. So so on and so forth, uh, by adhering to conspiracy uh, theories and thereby saying, uh, actually splitting. Mm. Everything that's bad in me, everything that's in unacceptable in me, everything I don't like in myself, is the outcome of some conspiracy. Mm. The New World Order, Zionists, <laughs> you name it. Mm. And everything that I do like and so on and so forth, uh, actually drives me to believe in conspiracy theories. For example, I'm a critical thinker. Right. I don't buy the mainstream stories, you know. So um, we would say that conspiracy theories are essentially egosyntonic. Yeah. And they provide only positive reinforcements. And this is, the, this is exactly the secret of the power of conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. While all other fields, politics, science, I mean, you name it, provide a mix of positive and negative reinforcements. For example, if you're trying to create a scientific theory, mm -hmm. sometimes you'll succeed, very often you will not. So there's always, you know, negative, positive. Mm -hmm. Conspiracy theories provide you only with positive reinforcement. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, by the way, they are, they are a conditioning experience. Because they condition you. But the, the real core of conspiracy theories is anxiety reduction. It is a form of self-medication. Now, we develop anxiety usually in two situations. Mm -hmm. Or when we are faced with a threat especially if, if the threat is not well-defined, a fuzzy threat, a kind of blurred threat, or when we are faced with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Of course, the two go together, because of the threat, you're uncertain, when you're uncertain, it feels threatening, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But generally, these are the two classes. And what, what um, conspiracy theory allows you mm -hmm. is to regain control. Control is utterly, utterly imaginary, mm -hmm. but isn't this the core of conspiracy theory? Conspiracy theory tells you, give up reality. Mm -hmm. So the imaginary control within the imaginary space of the conspiracy theory feels very real. Right. And so the control has three, three components. Um, the control is, is gained or accomplished via three components. Conspiracy theory provides meaning, provides an, an explanation, uh, explanation of the world. So it is, it is an explanatory principle. It's also, also an organizational principle. It takes disparate phenomena puts them together in what appears to be a coherent and logically consistent uh, system. Mm. In this sense, of course, conspiracy theory is scientific. A conspiracy th the conspiracy theories are scientific theories. Okay. This is exactly what science does. Yeah. Science tries to explain and organize disparate phenomena that apparently have no connection via a series of underlying principles. You will see as we progress, and if you survive, <laughs> you, you will see that conspiracy theories share, have many commonalities mm. with science okay. and with the pursuit of science, and mm. scientific principles. Uh, scientific. And that is, I think, one of the reasons they're so dur durable, mm. why, they, why they can't, I mean, just don't vanish, but yeah. because they appear to be very scientific. So this is the first, uh, we're talking about how conspiracy theory mm. theories allow you to feel that you had regained control. Okay. so that your anxiety is reduced. Mm -hmm. 
So one way is to explain the world, to give the world meaning, mm. organize it. The second way is to simplify it. Mm. Conspiracy theories remove all kinds of um, extraneous uh, fringe data mm -hmm. and remain with a very clear, bright, solid core. And they tell you, listen, ignore all this. Sometimes they tell you, listen, the other type of data or information are intended to mislead you. Right. I mean, don't pay attention to this. Mm -hmm. Uh, to con so, in effect, conspiracy theory theories are built on confirmation biases. Mm -hmm. They negate or vitiate countervailing information, and they create silos, they create bubbles mm -hmm. within which... But they simplify things. Again, it's exactly what science does. Mm -hmm. Science tells you, listen, mate, uh, pay attention to this and ignore all the rest. Mm -hmm. And this, we call it parsimony. This principle in science is called parsimony. You must pay, the simpler the theory is, the more likely it is that it is correct. The more, and also the more beautiful it is. Mm -hmm. Conspiracy theory of beauty, is aesthetics, we'll mm -hmm. talk about it later, if you're still alive. And the third element of regaining control mm -hmm. is identifying enemies. Okay. Conspiracy theory helps you to identify enemies. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to hog the conversation, although it's a bit too late. So, <laughs> um, I will not go right now into the character of the enemies, because con all conspiracy theories, without exception, mm -hmm. have enemies with three characteristics, okay. ultimately. Okay. But I will stop here. So this is, I think, this is a main psychological function, reduction of anxiety via an imaginary regaining of control via explan explanation or meaning, mm -hmm. um, simplifying and, f and identifying enemies. Which makes it sound <coughs> like a rational endeavor. Now, I've heard you say that you loathe conspiracy theories, but at the same time, you yourself with the Israeli intelligence services, you've been involved in conspiracies. So you hate conspiracy theories, but you've actively, you know that some conspiracy, conspiracies are real because you yourself are involved in designing them, executing them, and so on. There seems to be a, a non-congruence there. One of the... Uh one of the major characteristics of uh, conspiracy theory is what we call proportionality bias. Right. Proportionality bias simply means that if an event is a big event, mm. conspiracy theorists refuse to accept that the cause might be very small. But they say, well, if it's a big event, the cause must be big. Mm. Take, for example, Diana's death. Yeah. The official version is that Diana died in a car accident. Car accidents are pedestrian. Common, the British, they are, <laughs> they are, you know, they're small. Mm -hmm. Diana was big. Mm. Diana was a princess. Diana was, a, and her death was kind of mythological, mm -hmm. mythopoetic in a way. I mean, so people, uh, conspiracy theories say it can't be. It can't be that such a big uh, an event with such massive outcomes was perpetrated or generated or engendered or is the outcome of something so tiny mm. as a car accident, that can happen to me or you. Right. We are not Diana. Yeah. Well, I'm not. So, the, uh, this is called proportionality bias. Okay. That's the first thing that distinguishes real conspiracies mm -hmm. from, uh, I mean, conspiracy theories. Okay. Real conspiracies always maintain proportionality. If we want to achieve an outcome, we will never use too many resources, yeah. too many means, yeah. exaggerate. I mean, on the contrary, we'll try to minimize, mm -hmm. try to economize. Mm -hmm. While conspiracy theories will do exactly the opposite. They will take the, the, the event and they will not economize. They will magnify. They will add all kinds of layers. They will. Yeah. So this is the first uh, test, the first distinction. Yeah. The second distinction is what is called convergence theory. Convergence theory says that real-life conspiracies arise in multiple locations simultaneously. So, why? Because the same types of people have the same types of interests in the same type of environment, more or less, and so they, so they would tend to adopt the same type of measures without having communicated first with each other. Okay. So, if, if you have... Avaricious bankers, avaricious bankers in, in France, avaricious bankers in Canada, avaricious bankers in the United Kingdom and in Israel, and well, forget Israel, and in the uh, United States and so on. Mm -hmm. They will all be operating in the global financial village, in the international financial system. Mm -hmm. And the international financial system is, is universal. Mm -hmm. 
It, it, it is, is immediately identifiable in Tokyo, in New York, in London. In... So it's very likely that a Malaysian banker, an Israeli banker, a British banker, mm. and an American banker, who are unscrupulous, mm. psychopathic, mm. Uh, uh, like, like impulse control, it's, it's very likely that they will do exactly the same, mm. that they will adopt exactly the same antisocial behavior, criminal stratagems, Without meeting and without meeting, room, without communicating, without having ever heard of each other, okay. and that's called convergence theory. Okay, so they don't need to be an Illuminati with no. Cloaks there's no need for coordinating. That's that's. You ask me what's the difference between real conspiracy? Yeah. And, yeah. This is one of the major differences because yeah. conspiracy theories theorists always assume some hidden coordinating body, hand, um, organization, organ, mm. you know. While in reality, actually, there are no such things. Mm. Simply no such things. Mm. It could be that the Mossad and the CIA will have identical interests, mm. and it even could be that they will coordinate some, some operation or some, mm. some problem. But it's extremely rare for all the intelligence services in the world to, I mean, not rare, never happens. All of them to sit together and say, well, now we will suppress, suppress the masses on federal still on some money. Mm -hmm. It's rare. Yeah. But if you talk to conspiracy theorists, mm. They will tell you, of course, there's a, a world government, there's Bilderberg Group, there's the Illuminati, there's the, like... So this is another feature that is, in my view, separates. But if you're asking me, are there real-life conspiracies? Of course. Of course there are real-life conspiracies. So there are real-life conspiracies, but not in the way most conspiracy no. theorists lay them out. And, and they get it wrong mm. because they are not experienced. Right. They haven't been exposed to anything. Okay. Very few uh, conspiracy theories are, have, have had actually military experience or intelligence experience. Or, because when you, when you do go through all this, mm. government experience, mm. international uh, experience in international organizations, mm. because when you go through all this, you, you realize that actually it's convergence, it's not conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you're not case, even if you're a colonel in the army, you will exit the, the army and say there are UFOs. Mm -hmm. Because you are not case, not because you're colonial, right. you know. But uh, people who, who in the know mm -hmm. know that there is no in the know. Okay. People, only people who are outsiders mm -hmm. looking in mm -hmm. invent these kind of things. One of the reasons they invent these kind of things is because they want to belong. Yes. But we'll come to that. And sometimes they want to be paid. They want seminars. Okay, there's a lot of money. Yeah, there's yeah, gigantic huge money, in, huge money in conspiracy theories. True. Um, so this is how uh, the, the distinction is made for you between actually <coughs> having been involved in conspiracies and knowing full well there are conspiracies, but not global, large-scale conspiracy theories. N nothing in that, like uh, when they say a globalist agenda. No, no, no. And that wouldn't be an example of uh, convergence theory? You wouldn't have a lot well, of convergence maybe. Pointing in the same Convergence direction. maybe. But then, of course, you would see countries exiting and entering this. Yeah. So, for example, China. China in uh, 1949. Yeah. Would not be a globalist, right? But of course, it is not. Okay. So um, it, would, it would oscillate the behavior. It would oscillate. Oscillates. It would. It would. It there. There would always be a real life correlate. Mm. While conspiracy theories actually suggest that conspiracies have a life of their own that is utterly again no reality test. Yeah. That is utterly independent of reality. Yeah. What really happens is that multiple. I mean, numerous, like mm. thousands of interest groups. Mm -hmm. Uh, same professions, professional associations, mm. organizations, mm. small organizations, bigger organizations, mm. um, intelligence agents. Uh, uh, there are tens of thousands of competing players mm. in the international arena. You know? Yeah. And so it might happen that all of them will agree, or many of them will agree, that globalization is actually a very good idea. Yeah. So you would have, for example, industry, by the way, not all industry. You will have a part of industry that is opposed massively to globalization, yep. Yep. and a part of industry is supported. Yep. So let's say uh, finance, industry, intelligence community, I mean, you will have like several interest groups, and they will all think that globalization is a great uh, thing, and they will try to promote it in their own way, and so on and so forth. And of course, newspapers will think that, liberal media will think that, liberal academics will think that, and so on and so forth. But again, that's an excellent example, because one of the core tenets of globalization is free trade. Mm abhorred by liberal academics. Mm. Liberal academics support globalization, but hate free trade. Right. Conservative intellectuals mm. support free trade, but many of them abhor globalization. Oh, okay. I mean... So it's more it, nuanced no, than it's they, much would, more they would want it to be. So it's a way of simplifying reality, keeping it... Simplifying, static, yes, yes. Keeping it 
in a, in a structure. Keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. The stupid is the conspiracy theory. Yeah. So, the, this tendency to, because most conspiracy theories live in a constant state or, of their mental state is, I'm not in control. Mm. I am being controlled. There's alloplastic defenses. Mm -hmm. you know. Their external locus of control is, I mean, they have external locus of control. Yes. Right? Yeah. It's outside. Yeah. So they feel they are controlled from the outside. And so... Many of the delusions are literally that. I've got yes. a chip implanted in yeah. me and it's controlling Yeah, the tinfoil head uh, guys. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a chip this year. Is, but again, hey, look, people are talking about paranoia. And the paranoia has been the psychological explanation for conspiracy theories until at least 1994. It's no longer, by the way. Right. Uh, detailed studies of conspiracy theories have proven that the majority of them are actually not paranoid at all. Okay. By the way. Anxious, yes. Depressed, right. yes. Yeah. Paranoid. Yeah. But let's consider for a minute what is paranoia. Mm. Paranoia is a form of narcissism. If you are uh, monitored by the CIA, you are sufficiently important to be monitored by the CIA. It's a grandiose statement. Mm. Who the hell are you? Yeah. Why would the CIA monitor you? No, I, I they're monitoring me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to mask my home with tinfoil, with this. With it's, a, it's a grandiose statement. Mm. And what is grandiosity? Grandiosity is when you can't cope with reality anymore, yeah. when you create a false self. So in effect, conspiracy theories, um, all of them must have some kind of false self. Mm -hmm. But their false self, has less to do with them and more to do with the world. Mm. It's a very bizarre form of for self. Yeah. It's like they aggrandize themselves by claiming to have arca arcane privilege knowledge and by claiming to be the targets, overt or covert, mm. of the topics of their investigations. Mm -hmm. So they would tell you, listen, I'm now working on, uh, I discovered some uh, amazing, amazing thing with microwaves and so on. Mm. And I am sure it might have, uh, I mean, they might be after me. I mean, so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of reasserting oneself, wanting to be seen, mm. in effect. I want to be seen by the CIA, you know, yeah. wanting to be seen. <laughs> you, you begin to see how all the strands of narcissism, paranoia, it's, it all converges. It's a mental, in a way, kind of mental, mental health issue, mm. you know. But um, anxiety... As I told you, the, the, the attempt to reassert control is by identifying enemies. Mm. And again, I'll take a break here because maybe... The, 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 what I wanted to ask you is you mentioned the, that the Diana case. Uh, was there nothing in the official story <coughs> that, that struck you as odd or off? You thought, no, it's, no. A, it's a straight car crash. The guy was drunk. Well, was. well there, listen, one of the things conspiracy theories mm. ignore is they say to themselves, actually, they are naive. Mm. They're very gullible. Mm. They say, if someone says something, it must, it can be either this or it can be either totally true mm. or totally false. Yeah. People don't act this way. Yeah. People partly lie, mm. partly tell the truth, mm. partly confabulate around the truth, mm. partly tell a lie that might be true and they think, why not, it sounds plausible. Mm. Partly they don't remember, but they are ashamed to admit that they don't remember, so mm. they invent something. Mm. So for example, the, um, the driver, in the in this case, yeah. you know, he was he got a, a huge amount of money from the French intelligence services and so on and so forth. That's true. Mm -hmm. That part is true. Mm -hmm. But then you know, they investigated the 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 whole the whole thing and so on and so forth. So why did he get the money? Why didn't he? so conspiracy theorists will tell you will immediately divide the cast of characters. Mm -hmm. I believe this one. The, he he is telling the truth. Mm -hmm. While the driver is lying, I'm sure he's lying. Mm. I'm so, but it's not like that. Mm. Maybe he was on his way to his mistress. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want you to know that. Yeah. Maybe he, maybe he's a bloody drug addict. Maybe yeah. he's gay. Maybe he's, I mean, yeah. Conspiracy theories refuse to accept that the world is gray, is nuanced, is, is uh, you know, for them the world. So this is splitting. Yeah. All bad, all good. All black, all white. Mm -hmm. All, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, in this sense, conspiracy theories are very infantile. Yeah. Very, it's an infantile kind of thing. Um, please, please drink some. It's like, it's like being teased with the possibility you might drink. <laughs> it's been laced. The CIA poisoned me. That's why I wanted you to My last segment. <laughs> and my five sent me. That's LSD. <laughs> he nobody doesn't know. The Mossad gave me an anti-water, which I drank before I came here. <laughs> so, <coughs> so, 
So, so the um, what you're what you're saying is that, um, or what I think I can hear you saying is, there are conspiracies, there are assassinations. Absolutely, people do things covertly, but that the general mode of organising reality and retelling the story by conspiracy theorists is wrong. But there are conspiracy theorists who you do admire, who you have even spoken with and found that their their version of events actually was, their analysis was very clear. So you don't hate all conspiracy theorists. Some, especially British conspiracy theories, uh, theorists I hate, but... <laughs> No, it's a question of hating. It's a question of uh, how rigorous the research is. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely possible to come to the conclusion that there had been a true, a real-life conspiracy. Mm. The, the tests are how rigorous the research had been, how nuanced the findings are, mm -hmm. whether the doubt, what is the locus of the doubt, whether the doubt is about marginal issues or core issues, mm whether there is a proportionality bias so that minor topics are inflated to become very big uh, topics. So these are all tests which are, are common in academe. Mm -hmm. And indeed, the best conspiracy theories, if you want to call them this way, all come from academe. So for example, I've had a kind of relationship with uh, Ray Griffin, 9-11. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So Ray wrote a series of uh, books about 9-11, and um, they read like a scientific investigation. Mm. He's very, because he's a professor mm. in uh, emeritus in the university. So he applies a scientific method, he tests, he falsifies. Mm. Popper, he falsifies the theory, then he builds another theory. I recognize it, I'm a physicist. Mm. I recognize his way of work. Mm. And he reaches a conclusion which I don't feel comfortable with. So I will not agree with his conclusion. But hey, listen, I don't agree with string theory. Mm. I don't agree with quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. I mean, so what, what was his ultimate conclusion for 9-11? Uh, that the United States government had been involved. And, and that it was a, a splinter group within the United States government? He, he wouldn't go into that, but I think uh, the impression that he gave is that uh, he thinks the total, I mean, the entire government. Oh, really? It was a black flag operation. A black flag operation. Yes. Okay. So um, I disagree almost vehemently, but that's not the issue at all. I can follow his argumentation, agree with his methodology, mm. understand at least his methodology and so on, and respect his uh, conclusions, mm -hmm. agree to disagree, exactly like in physics. Mm. You know. So this does not happen with classic conspiracy theories, yeah. uh, who, are, who are not rigorous, not methodical, not, uh, they create the impression mm. of rigor and method mm -hmm. by making lists, mm. the hallmark, of the bed, inane conspiracy theorist, is lists. Mm. They have gigantic lists, 200 items, 2,000 items, 2 million items. The longer the list, the more respectable you are, mm. the more you should be listened to, and so on and so forth. Mm. Lists are not substitute to, to reasoning, mm. and yet most conspiracy theorists think they are. So for example, if they want to prove to you that the Illuminati ruled the earth, they would make lists. In the year 1736, uh, uh, House, uh, I mean, uh, House did this in the year. So, and then they would make all these lists, and they would say, so could it be a coincidence, tell me, that in 1944, Orchild used the toilet three times, and in 1945, also three times. Mm. Can this be a coincidence? Mm. So, conspiracy theorists also resort to um, rhetorical rhetorical stratagems and rhetorical instruments that are um, not fair. Mm. So for example, they would uh, juxta juxtapose some facts or mostly factoids, very often mm. nonsense. They would ju juxtapose and then they would ask, no, don't you think it, it tells you something? I mean, they would not like draw a conclusion or anything, but they yeah. would say, well, don't you see the pattern? I'll, I'll leave it to the audience. Yes, there. don't you see the pattern? Yeah. I mean, they let you draw the pattern. Mm. It's an example of a rhetorical device which is essentially indefensible. Dishonest, it, at least. Dishonest, indefensible. Yeah. And yields, of course, to multiplicity of answers. I mean, yeah. you see something, I see something, yeah. and so on and so forth. But it's only one example of such a rhetorical... There are many <laughs> such... A, so... Um, but I think the core... The core 
the core of every conspiracy theory is the identification, its list of enemies. Mm. That's absolutely the core. So maybe it's time now to, to deal with enemies, unless you're... I mean. Yeah, the, the only thing I was going to uh, <coughs> ask you is if you think it's worth... When, when I was pulling out of that field, I was thinking about it, and I thought there seems to be value in inverting the proposition, where you say, okay, well, I don't actually really like a lot of these conspiracy theories because myself, even though I, I believe there is a conspiracy, because they put in an answer instead of just leaving it as a question. So then you, I would say, well, maybe it's more healthy to invert it and say, okay, I'm an official story denier. That story sounds like horseshit to me, but I'm not now going to fill in the gaps and go, oh, it was the Russians, oh, it was the Israelis, oh, it was... Then you make yourself, you discredit yourself mm -hmm. with, the in, with the insertion of a theory about the conspiracy right. theory. Right. Maybe, maybe it's better to just say, okay, I'm an official story denier, this doesn't seem right. Right. Could be. Do you think that, that would be healthier? Could be, but it's not rigorous. Okay. If I apply a scientific method to conspiracy theories, because mm -hmm. conspiracy theories are hypotheses about history. Mm -hmm. We have this. Mm -hmm. We have a hypothesis, a hypothesis about history in, in history, mm -hmm. in the science of history, in history departments in universities. People sit around and say, okay, let's try to decipher why the Vikings uh, I don't know, invaded uh, Britain this year and not five years earlier. So they create a, a series of uh, hypotheses. Conspiracy theory is, is a form of hypothesizing in history, on history. Mm. And there are clear, uh, rigorous tools on how to do it. There's a way to do it. Yeah. Asking open-ended questions or insinuating, or that's not one of the tools most historians would use. Mm. Um, most historians actually would go the way you described. They would say, well, this, that, this, that, so it seems that actually the, the, the Slavs invaded the Balkans in the 7th century. Mm -hmm. I mean, they would not leave it open-ended. Yeah. Um, history provides possible answers. Okay. So when I see a conspiracy theory that is constructed of a set of facts, then a series of hypotheses, then falsifying the hypothesis, uh, and then um, providing an answer which relies on the remaining surviving hypothesis, mm -hmm. that's a scientific method. Okay. But it, it, it must include an answer. Uh, in, in the case of 9-11, um, even though you don't agree with uh, Ray Griffin's conclusion, there are elements of 9-11 that you, you find suspicious as well, right? Most. Most of the elements. Most elements. But the idea that it was a, a false flag by the American government, you think that is? That particular idea doesn't strike me as, uh, as true, but it's true that most of the uh, ostensible facts about 9-11 are, how to put it, mildly subject to doubt. Okay. Uh, mildly. Mildly. Very mildly. Now, here's a, a, an interesting case. When you are faced with a historical narrative mm -hmm. where most of the underlying assumptions and the uh, ostensible facts are easily contestable, easily contestable, it might be a good indication of a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you study JFK, JFK's mm -hmm. assassination, that's not the case. Okay. The majority of the facts, the majority of the assumptions, I mean, overwhelming majority, like 99.9, percent of the facts and the assumptions and so on are not contestable. Mm -hmm. You can contest the, the famous bullet. Mm -hmm. You can contest whether there was a second shooter on the grassy knoll. Mm -hmm. But frankly, that's more or less where you stop. Yeah. The rest begins to be rapid speculation. The second shooter was Russian. Second shooter was CIA. Uh, I mean, that's where it stops. Rapid speculation, I like that, because that, that seems to be what the field suffers from. And mm -hmm. if you're going to, I would never bother, but if you're going to have a forum and try and control it, you'd say you need to have a diet against... Yeah, I mean, you can say, listen, the anatomical facts of it yeah. support the possibility, the, the distinct possibility, by the yeah. way. There was a second shooter on the grassy knoll. Yes. But there, there you must stop. Yes, then you stop. You can't say, and that proves that it's probably the CIA. Okay, so there's a, there's a human fallibility, there's a temptation yeah. to go, yeah. oh, the bullet seems to have gone in there because the yeah. piece of skull came. So therefore... Blah, 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 blah. Therefore, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, whatever you want. that's why you must stop if you're a scientist. Yeah. You say, well, there are... Now, in JFK's case, mm. if I am very generous, there are three such facts, mm. which are really contestable. Yeah. But in 9-11, there are only three facts which are not contest contestable. And all the rest? And all the rest is utterly contestable. Yeah. Utterly. And has been contested, in my view, very, very successfully. By, by the way, by majority, engineers, yeah, scientists, scientists, physicists, pilots, pilots yeah. I mean, yeah. qualified people. Even uh, people who bring down buildings, 
to yes, be demolish, shown. Demolition experts. Demolition experts. experts. So that's the difference between JFK and... Uh, there, there's a huge difference. The huge difference. It's, uh, and so it's the same with all other conspiracy theories. And then the, you have the pseudoscience. Mm -hmm. A lot of pseudoscience masquerades as a conspiracy theory. Yeah. So, or the pseudoscience, and then the, the adherents of the pseudoscience would say, people are conspiring against us because we are saying the truth. Mm -hmm. Because we discovered something mm -hmm. that everyone else wants to suppress. Mm -hmm. So they actually combine pseudoscience with a conspiracy theory. Yeah. They say we are we're the subject of the conspiracy. Yeah. So, I don't know, flat earth or whatever. So yeah. they say, well, we discovered this amazing set of facts, but it's being suppressed. Now, usually, um, this kind of conspiracy is an aggrandizing conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Look what we discovered. We're so geniuses. So, obviously, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a backlash. Mm -hmm. So this, this kind of conspiracy is, is intended to aggrandize the adherents. Yeah. And then, of course, there are the utterly outlandish conspiracy theories whose sole purpose is to provide a sense of belonging. And the narcissistic gratification of access to arcane and um, privileged knowledge, mm. and the possibility to attain expertise in 20 days rather than, for example, 20 years. Yeah. If I want to be a very good quantum uh, physicist, it would take me 20 years. Mm. It would take you 20 years. It would take me uh, two years. If <laughs> I think even after 20 years, I'd be in trouble. I'm kidding. I, in my view, 18. The, the, uh, but seriously, if I want to be a quantum physicist, it takes me many years. Mm. But if I, I want to be an expert on, uh, on some pseudoscience, mm. I don't know, uh, flat earth, it would take me three weeks. Mm. <laughs> if I'm extremely slow and retarded, mm. you know? <laughs> and after three weeks, I am self-certified as an expert. I can yeah. already participate in forums, express opinions. Yeah. This, that. It's very gratifying narcissistically. Mm. It's like instant academic degree, mm -hmm. you know? You can't get it in physics, but you can get it in astrology, numerology, tarot, uh, flat earth, reptilians. I mean, um, so conspiracy theories and pseudoscience, which are cousins, mm. provide instant gratification via instant expertise. Mm. And status, uh, relative positioning, mm -hmm. higher status within a hierarchy mm -hmm. of self-styled experts that depends from that moment on mm -hmm. only on how vocal you are mm -hmm. and how loyal you are, yeah. how orthodox you are. Yeah. That's it. These are the qualifications you need. And you progress. It's like tenure in a university. Yeah. I have been, uh, you're telling me, I've been doing astrology for 23 years. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Sorry. What can you teach me? I mean, so, and uh, so this is this is the nexus between uh, pseudoscience and conspiracy theories. With something like, uh, you know, say, with 9/11, JFK, Diana, these are all things we've touched on. They're based on events. Uh, you said, I'm sorry, you said historical. That there's a there's a there's an area in history where we try to get a hypothesis. A hypothesis, historical hypothesis. Flat Earth is not. It's not based on an event. It's, it's pseudoscience. A, it's just an emergency. It's not an conspiracy. It's pseudoscience. Ah, okay. It's pseudoscience. All oh, right. Okay. So if there's if if they then say oh like perpetual mobile creating the the infinite uh, right. You know. So if they say they're trying to ban or suppress the idea of flat Earth, that's the conspiracy. Theory. That's the conspiracy. But the flat Earth concept itself is just pseudoscience. Pseudoscience. Okay. So let's take a little bit of a digression then into pseudoscience. Why is this emerging now? Why so the sciences? Well, flat Earth particularly. Um, there's something I heard about back in 2012. I genuinely thought that it was a joke, that people were trolling. They would say, oh, I'm a flat earther, <coughs> ah, 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 just to be silly. And then after time, I, I realized, no, these people actually genuinely think that the Earth is flat. Any ideas as to why? Well, first of all, uh, it's not new. Flat Earth theories have been around since the last third of the 19th century. And they're based on utterly mistaken understanding, a misunderstanding of the properties of the uh, chem chemical physical properties of water, um, astronomical observations, etc. So they are based on very bad non science. So. Do you mean gibberish? Gibberish, utter, <laughs> utter gibberish. There has no I mean, foundation or anything anywhere. And um, so, it, but it's not new. Like all other pseudosciences, none of them is new. Mm. 
almost none of them is new. They've been around, some of them have been around for hundreds of years. Yeah. Alchemy is having a resurgence, astrology, uh, other occult sciences. Uh, I mean, they're all resurging. Um, so why are they resurging now, generally speaking? Mm. They are all resurging now, I think, because the world had become way too complex to understand via traditional tools, mm -hmm. like, for example, education. Mm -hmm. Because educators have abrogated the duty yeah. uh, by simplifying education to the point that you learn nothing, yeah. except how to learn, whatever that means. Um, so the world is very complex. You have an in, uh, immediate instinct to simplify it. And whatever you say about pseudosciences, they are simple. Mm -hmm. They're very simple. They simplify. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is narcissistic gratification. Because how many people can be successful quantum physicists? Mm -hmm. In this room, for example. Mm -hmm. Only me. <laughs> only, only me. No one else here can be even the Q of the quantum. So. Uh, but if you want to feel qualified, expert, authority, mm. guru, mm. You know, well, you have a shortcut. Yeah. Flat Earth. Three weeks, mm -hmm. if you're a guitar, mm -hmm. and you're an expert. So these um, pseudosciences provide shortcuts to the eminence and relative positioning and the status mm. that is usually reserved to, used to be reserved to true intellectuals mm. in academe, in, in the public sphere, and mm. so on. So they are ersatz fake intellectuals, right. ersatz fake uh, professors, mm. ersatz fake everything. Yeah. So it's all fake. It's a simulacrum mm. of, of the real thing, mm -hmm. which is academe. Mm -hmm. um, it ties in with the narcissistic gratification of conspiracy theories, because conspiracy theories tell you you are special. You are special because you are the target of CIA. You are special because you have acquired privileged information. You are special because you have access to arcane data. You are special. Mm. You're special. Yeah. That's to be special. And pseudoscience tells you, you, you are special. Mm. Not everyone. So it's about belonging, about being special, mm. but also about belonging. Mm. Belonging to a special group. Here's the, here's the, the a very important distinction. Mm. Traditional modes of knowledge, for example, science, mm. never tell you you're special. They tell you you're not special. Mm -hmm. You're not special. It's hard on the ego. Science yes, you are not special. Mm. Even Einstein is not special. Mm. They are not, there's no special status mm. in physics, or no special status in chemistry. Mm. The main message of science is humility. Main, that they are, that they are arrogant scientists, mm. like Stephen Hawking or Michiri Kaku, mm -hmm. That's a flaw of character. Mm. But science, its main broadcast mm. is be humble. Mm. Uh, Einstein said, I'm a child standing on the shoulder of giants uh, on, the, on the shorefront of the ocean. Mm. And that's exactly science. Mm. So science teaches you to, be, to gain perspective, to, to go, reduce to size, reduces you to size. While pseudosciences do exactly the opposite. Mm. They tell you you're, you're special. Not many people know that. Not many people believe that. Not many people are capable of understanding this. Mm. That, you have, that you have understood it makes you special. Yeah. That means you are super intelligent. You are. So, uh, pseudoscience is the mirror image of science. Mm. Exactly the mirror image. What you see in science is missing in pseudoscience. What you see in pseudoscience, etc. Same with conspiracy theories. Mm. Conspiracy theory is, like, is the mirror image of history. Mm. History is complex, nuanced, mm. gradual, gradual, mm. not controlled by small groups of people. Mm. I mean, and conspiracy theories are exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. Why do we need these mirrors? Because rea reality had become too much, mm. simply too much. It's too complex, too dire, too, too frightening, too unpredictable, too everything. When I looked into the flat earth theorists to find out what they were really about, but if you go a little bit deeper into it, it seems a lot of them are fundamentalist Christians and they want to believe that God is holding us in the palm of his hand on a flat earth. And when it's, I a, it's a strand of flat earth, but I, I it's not the totality. I had, I had a lot more sympathy then, because I was like, oh, it's like a religious belief. You want to feel observed, you want to be seen, you, you want to feel like there's stability. Okay, it's crazy, but fine, that, that, you know, that particular strand of flat earth. That. And that's precisely the distinction between faith, mm. faith mm. and inquiry. Right. 
Uh, Kierkegaard would say, said that in order to believe, mm. you need a leap of faith. Mm -hmm. You need to leap. Conspiracy theories and pseudoscience requires a leap, require a leap of faith. Mm. You just have to believe. You know? Science uh, requires you to go step by step. And each step can be falsified, can be a minefield. You, have to, you may be thrown back 20 steps after 20 years. You know? And conspiracy theories and so on are therefore much, much more akin to religion or cults. Mm -hmm. Cults or religions or... Where <clears throat> a centralized authority, either human or non-human, mm -hmm. like knowledge, mm -hmm. body of knowledge, mm -hmm. a centralized authority actually guarantees, guarantees uh, narcissistic gratification, guarantees status, guarantees access, and so on and so forth on condition that you believe mostly unquestioningly. If you go to forums of pseudo, pseudo, if you go to forums related to pseudoscience or conspiracy theories, there are many, many, many questions about the details, mm -hmm. many, mm -hmm. but never about the paradigm. Mm -hmm. For example, if you go to a forum about JFK, JFK's assassination, you can find debates. The bullet was this. The second shooter was there. No, he was not there. He was there because two policemen went to the bridge. He must have been near the bridge. No, come on. He was not near the bridge. He must have been that side because there's a family that ran to that side. All true, by the way. There's a family that ran to this side, so he must have been that side. No, come on. You know what you're talking about. There was Ray Ventura in 1976 when he was uh, dying after he ate falafel, and he said that there was, uh, you know, all kinds. So enormous debates about trivia. Mm. Pseudosciences and conspiracy theories are trivial. Mm. They're trivia oriented. There was a game when I was young, the dinosaurs, you know, a trivial pursuit. Mm -hmm. These are trivial pursuits. Mm. But you will never find in a forum of JFK assassination, mm. uh, I believe in the Warren report. I think he was assassinated by Oswald. Right. You'll be immediately blocked. So we're all sat in church. We're inside the church. We're kind yes. of arguing about You can argue about anything, but never about God. Yeah. Okay? So. <laughs> JFK was assassinated by someone other than Oswald. Now you can debate CIA, Russian, this bullet, so that bullet. So even as we're debating, we're affirming the super belief, the higher belief. The, the hyperstructure, as it is called technically, the hyperstructure is, is taboo, mm -hmm. untouchable. Mm -hmm. Anyone who dares to challenge it is excommunicated immediately. Exactly, like Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. Immediately excommunicated. Mm -hmm. This never happens inside. Mm -hmm. I can go to any scientific forum and say, listen, uh, quantum mechanics, in my view, is total bullshit. Because uh, this and this and this and this. They would weigh my arguments. They would say, listen, you're an idiot. I mean, your arguments suck. Mm -hmm. Or they may regard my arguments as worthy and they will start a debate. But no one will tell me, what? You are saying that quantum mechanics sucks? You're excommunicated, banished, blocked, banned, and we will send a firing squad to your place. I mean, that's the difference mm -hmm. between these two. These are, these are faiths, mm. they're religions, many religions, cults, you know, that's the difference. Again, coming back to the issue of identification of enemies, I am going to say that nothing you can do will prevent me from, from talking about the enemies. It's happening. I know that we've been trying, you've been trying, but <laughs> it's not working, it will fail. I'll Why to, to try? I must have Just see if I can enjoy it. <laughs> <coughs> the... Enemies identified by conspiracy theories usually share three characteristics. Mm -hmm. First of all, it must always be a small group. Mm -hmm. A conspiracy theory or a, a pseudoscience will never say uh, a gigantic group of uh, people have, has an effect on a small group of people. It will always be a tiny group of people mm -hmm. has an effect on an enormous number of people. So it's always a theory of minority. Mm -hmm. There's some minority, the Jews, the Illuminati, mm -hmm. or the Jewish Illuminati, or, you know, it's always some small group. It's a critical thing, mm. because in history, actually, it's exactly the opposite. Mm. In history, usually, huge forces mm. affect individuals. Nazi Germany mm. killed my family. Mm. Nazi Germany mm. killed my family. Yeah. In conspiracy theory, a family ruled mm. Nazi Germany. Right. It's an inversion. Mm. Small, big, big, small. Mm. So the, the enemies must always be a tiny clique, mm. clique, number, group, 
minority. You know. The second thing that um, the enemies must be, they must be antisocial. They must be antisocial. They must have some s criminal, one could say, um, plans in mind. They're psychopaths. All these minority groups, Illuminati, Bilderberg, these, they, they're all psychopaths, kind of. They're psychopathic. They're, they're reckless, they're ruthless, they're self-interested, they're narcissistic, they are, you know, they pursue money, and sex, power. I mean, they are psychopaths, institutionalized psychopaths. So they are all antisocial. But I think perhaps the most uh, interesting facet of enemy, the enemy status in conspiracy theories, is that these enemies, while they have inordinate influence, they micromanage your life, are very much like God. They're invisible. Mm -hmm. They're invisible. I mean, you know, Illumina have you ever seen Illuminatus? Mm -hmm. Plus Illuminatus I saw, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no Illuminatus. Mm -hmm. But you know they exist. Mm -hmm. You never saw one. You never shook hands with one. You know, no, no Illuminatus micromanage your life, but absolutely, they, if you think they don't exist, you're an idiot. Mm -hmm. Of course they exist. Mm -hmm. Let me just look around. So, um, the enemies are covert. They're hidden. They're surreptitious. They are... And here, ironically, I will tell you something that um, is a bit uh, counterintuitive. That's precisely the approach of science. Science says, listen, you see all this? This is not real. Under it, underneath it, there is a layer that is covert. Covert and made up of tiny number of entities. This tiny number of entities produce all of, all, everything you see. Mm. Produce Richard Grannon mm. and uh, Lee and, and uh, even to some extent Sam Vaknin and so on. The, so these entities, which are small in number, mm. you know, the number of electronic uh, um, elementary particles is uh, 90, mm. small in number. This tiny number of entities is covert. Mm. You never see them or touch them or anything. And they produce everything you see. It's exactly what conspiracy theories claim. But conspiracy theories regard these entities as enemies, mm. while science doesn't regard them as enemies, it regards them as constituents of matter, constituents of energy. So science regards the world as the overt expression of a covert reality. Mm -hmm. So do conspiracy theories. But conspiracy theories say the world is an overt expression of an antisocial, criminalized, I don't want to say motherfucker, um, <laughs> you know, mm. uh, reality. Yeah. Reality is a, is a horror movie. Mm. It's horrid, it's frightening, it's terrifying. It's, and it's covert. Mm. And it produces everything you see. You uh, worked in the Israeli Air Force for a number of years. Do you think um, it's possible that with the technology that we had back then that we sent humans to the moon, they landed and then came back? In 1969? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Actually, um, about, let's say, four of, about half, all the necessary technological advances were already available in 1927 mm -hmm. with uh, Tsiolkovsky, the Russian Tsiolkovsky. And I would say the rest was available by the, by the beginning of the 1950s, when American scientists, the guy who established the J, JPL, mm -hmm. Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and by the way, a conspiracy theorist of the first degree. The guy who, who invented, who, the guy who created a company called uh, Jet Propulsion Jack, Laboratory. Jack Parsons, are you talking about? Yes. Yeah, the Alistair Crowley. Thing yes, like, Alistair yeah. Crowley. It's conspiracy theory, yeah. first degree. Yeah. But he, he came up with the JPL in Caltech and so yeah. on. So I would say that by 1953, 4, mm -hmm. um, all the elements existed. Do you think that we have. Uh, by the way, many of them imported from Nazi Germany. Oh, by yes. von Neumann. Yeah, yeah, without the Germans. That's not a conspiracy. That's, that's true. That's historical. That's absolutely fact, true. Isn't it? Do you think that we could have. Uh, and this conspiracy, sorry, this conspiracy um, was first described by mm. conspiracy theories, and no one believed it, mm -hmm. until, until documents were declassified, mm. and we discovered Operation Clip Paper. Uh, paper, yeah, clip. paper Clip. Paper Clip. Paper clip. Yeah. Operation Paper Clip, in which von Neumann and others were yeah. brought into... They were recruited. Yeah. They needed all their, their expertise. Do you think that it was possible at that time to transmit live television images all the way back to Earth? Of course. Yeah. Live television images were transmitted to even larger distances in 1936 really? when Hitler uh, introduced television to cover the Olympics mm -hmm. in Berlin. Some of, the, some of the transmissions went as far as 8,000 miles. 
Um, this is from the moon, though. Yes, but uh, you, you're ignoring the strength of the signal. If you ad adjust for the strength of the signal, mm -hmm. it's more or less like 150 million kilometers. That, that, uh, that Hitler transmitted yes. television. If you adjust the strength of the right, signal of the television yeah. to yeah. televisions in the 60s mm -hmm. or late 60s, then it's, it's like 150 million. Oh, okay. So, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. All these nonsense. Yeah. The moon hoax is. That, that's kind of one of the more less. Uh, the less wise ones. Mm -hmm. Because they're wise conspiracies, clever conspiracies. Yeah. That's a not so clever one. The other interesting conspiracy. Conspiracy theories is a fascinating thing. Mm. I'm not saying uh, it's not. But uh, it has all these uh, features. Mm -hmm. a conspiracy theories, technically, in, in psychology, clinical psychology, is a um, no, uh, manifestation of something called pareidolia. Mm -hmm. Pareidolia is when you see patterns where there are none. Mm -hmm. So conspiracy theory is a form of pareidolia. Mm -hmm. Now, you need pareidolia in science as well. Yeah. You see all kinds of things. But science has developed a set of very powerful tools to tell you mm -hmm. if your pareidolia is pareidolia, mm -hmm. then you should go to a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm and divorce your wife, or mm -hmm. if your pareidolia is, is a pattern. Mm -hmm. So science has tools to distinguish patterns from pareidolia. Not so, of course, conspiracy theories. They're not qualified. They don't want to do it. Yeah. But technically, it's a, a form of um, wrongful pattern recognition, okay. pareidolia. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially in, in, uh, in uh, pseudoscience. I think one major thing with conspiracy theories and pseudoscience is action avoidance. Mm -hmm. If everything is controlled by the Illuminati, there's nothing much you can do or should do. That is that that is why I got out of the conspiracy theory. Yeah. Because that was the effect it was having. It's on numbing. The action avoidance. Very numbing, it's very numbing. suffocating. It's numbing. It encourages you to have to adopt a passive mm. mindset mm. and a passive set of so many of these people start as very active. They do research, but they end up after a few years recluses, mm. hidden in uh, you know, rooms, and because it encourages inaction. Mm. It's action avoidance. If the world is really controlled by Illuminati, what is there for you to do? Mm -hmm. If science is lying to us about everything, why to study? Mm. If so, at the end result of every single mm. conspiracy theory is well, there's nothing I can do about it. Why bother? Yeah. Why bother? That who was the government, why bother to study science, why bother to, you know, everyone is lying, everyone is uh, conspiring and cheating. Apart from 9-11, have you seen any other conspiracy theory where you've looked at it and thought, yeah, there is some serious problems with the official story? Apart from 9-11? Yeah. Um, UFOs is an interesting case mm -hmm. because Thousands of tens of thousands of sightings have been, without any doubt, suppressed. Mm. And yet, what I believe UFOs are, are experimental v um, kind of uh, airplanes. Yeah. I mean, I don't believe that UFOs are ex extraterrestrial. Mm. It's pretty easy to prove they're not. But uh, I do believe that the government is suppressing information, mm -hmm. actively suppressing information, about experimental vehicles, experimental balloons, and mm -hmm. all kinds of things like mm -hmm. that, flown radars. And, mm -hmm. So here's an example of a conspiracy, but when you take out the extraterrestrial sting, mm -hmm. conspiracy theorists are not interested. If you go to forums, yeah. if you go to forums and you say, listen, <coughs> you are right, mm -hmm. there are UFOs. Mm. And yes, the government is actively lying, suppressing, mm. manipulating, punishing, mm. maybe even killing people. Mm. Yes, this is absolutely right. Mm. But they are not aliens. They are Secret government program. Mm -hmm. Give me a break. Yeah. It's not interesting. Yeah. You, know? you said that it would be easy to prove that they're not alien technology. How would it be, how would it be easy to prove? Well, there's a series of equations called uh, the, uh, the Fermi challenges and the Drake formulas that, uh, that uh, demonstrate that for uh, an alien vehicle to reach here mm. would require... There are so many requirements, technological requirements, for yeah. such a vehicle that the aliens should be seriously retarded to, <laughs> to, uh, to make such an attempt. I mean, really? Yeah, because... Because of the distances involved. So to compensate for that, yeah. because some conspiracy theorists are versed in this. They know. Yeah. So say, yeah, it's true. I mean, yeah. But it's worth it. It's worth it because we are a zoo. Mm. It's worth it because we're an experimental station, genetic, mm. experimental genetic station. Mm. It's worth it because in their home planet, they don't have water. Uh, 
It's worth it because our atmosphere resembles the atmosphere in their post-apocalyptic mm -hmm. planet and they are. So all, all they're trying to compensate. Interesting stories for sci-fi novels, all of these. Yes, you know, essentially sci-fi. By but the way, it, it's, affinity it's, is huge. Affinity? But affinity between sci-fi and conspiracy is enormous. Yeah, Asimov is, hasn't he proven, been pro he's predicted real science many times. Yeah, he? no, I'm not talking about this. I'm oh. not talking about science fiction predicting science. Oh, I see. I'm talking about affinity between conspiracy theories okay. and science fiction. Oh, I see, I see. So, for example, uh, 2001 Odyssey, mm -hmm. Space Odyssey. Mm. So there's HAL, HAL 9000, yeah, yeah. the computer which takes over and so on. So one of the major themes of conspiracy theories, mm. propagated by the likes of Elon Musk and Steven Spielberg, uh, mm. Steve, uh, Stephen Hawking mm. and so on, is that AI one day will take over the planet, kill all humans or enslave them, more likely. Mm. God knows what, I mean, if, <laughs> if you are AI, why do you need humans? Okay enslave them, and that will be the end of humanity. Yeah. That's a conspiracy theory. Yeah. I mean, it, doesn't, it sounds like it's coming from authorities like Stephen Hawking. Yes. But even Stephen Hawking and Nobel Prize winners can come up with conspiracy theories. Another conspiracy theory, which was propagated by a two Nobel Prize winner, two-time mm. Nobel Prize winner, mm. Linus Pauling, yeah. was that actually the best, the only medic medicine required is vitamin C, but the pharmaceutical companies are lying to us about this. And, and all you have to do is take 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C every day. He is right. If you take 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C every day, you will die very soon and you will never be sick again. It's absolutely true. Scientific. <laughs> but it's an example of a conspiracy theory. Yeah. The guy was not an idiot. Yeah. He won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. Yeah. In chemistry. So vitamin C. Yeah. Vitamin C is an acid, mm -hmm. ascorbic acid. Mm -hmm. So it's his field. Mm. And yet he came up with conspiracy theory. Right. So it's not true that all conspiracy theories are fed, like uh, Donald Trump said, a fed 400 uh, pound uh, kid. Uh, you know. yeah, yeah. It's not. Yeah. And now, of course, sometimes conspiracy theories take over the public imagination, consume public resources, and become kind of public uh, hysteria, or mass mm -hmm. hysteria, mm -hmm. mechautism, mm -hmm. communism. Mm -hmm. But more recently, the Russia collusion. Mm. The collusion of Donald Trump with Russia. Yes. It's a conspiracy theory par yes. excellence. Yes. Yeah. And after two years of investigation, it had been proven to be a conspiracy theory. Mm. There was nothing there. Nor did I ever think there was not anything there. Yeah. So conspiracy theories are not limited to disheveled 400 pound fetos, mm. couch potatoes. In It's not. It's common among Nobel Prize winners. Yeah. In the, in, um, in the Attorney General staff of the United States, in the Senate, in the um, conspiracy theory is a natural human inclination mm. to cope with complex reality by simplifying it to the point of naivety mm -hmm. and, sorry to say, idiocy. Mm. It's a common natural reaction. In, in that same vein, um, it's not really a conspiracy theory, I guess, it's more pseudoscience. You've heard of the idea that because we as human beings seem so uncomfortable here, so out of place and so different from other animals, that there must be some alien intervention to our development, our evolution, <coughs> brain size and all this kind of thing. Do you think that's an example of just trying to find a simple solution to complex questions? It's an example of criminal ignorance of uh, recent evolutionary theory. Mm -hmm. Evolution, this is a response to Darwinian evolution which was developed in, in 1870. Mm -hmm. 1870, I was still young, but I remember that, uh, you know, it started to develop even then. Immediately, Thomas Huxley developed it. And so. so today, we don't believe in this. Okay. We don't believe that evolution is graduated. It's a gradual process. So Darwinian, the Darwinian model is not... The, the very old Darwinian model. Yeah. Today, okay. we believe in something called punctuated equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Punctuated equilibrium is a theory propagated, pr proposed by, uh, promulgated by Stephen Jay Gould, Gould, the late Stephen Jay Gould, and today is widely accepted. It means that there is a period of stasis, of stagnation, which is enormous, like would be like hundreds of millions of years, mm -hmm. and then suddenly there's a jump, mm. there's a spurt, and a totally new species appears mm -hmm. that seems to have nothing to do with previous species. Mm. Of course it has, on the genetic level and so on, but it looks, the phenotype, phenotype means how it looks. Okay. The, fen the genotype is actually gradual, mm -hmm. mutations, but the phenotype looks completely insane. Yeah. So people who say that humans don't fit in Earth because they are so widely removed from everything, uh, I mean, that's, that's punctuated equilibrium. Mm -hmm. We have thousands of other examples 
of suddenly appearing birds or suddenly appearing bacteria even. Or, I mean, uh, life forms suddenly appear mm -hmm. and they look like they have nothing to do with previous life forms. Okay. That's today's evolution theory. Mm -hmm. not Darwin. But it's still, it's still a response and an adaptation to the environment, just not this gradual adaptation. It's not gradual. But okay. because it's not gradual, people who are not in yeah. not evolution, yeah. they would tend to say, wow, how did this appear? I mean, yeah. it must have been some intervention. Yeah. It's creationism. It's disguised creationism. Right. Like life and the world could not have been created without a designer. It's yeah. the watchmakers. Yeah, yeah. Watchmakers Black argument. Watchmaker, yeah. 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 So, like, uh, if there's a watch, there must be a watchmaker. I right. mean, if there's a life, there must be a life maker. If there's yeah. a world, there must be a world, a maker of the worlds. Yeah. Of course, that's not true. Yeah. I mean, uh, we we create in laboratories, uh, of course, life, and we create in laboratories also um, spontaneous order, and you can do it at home. Mm. There is a um, um, solution, chemical solution, called Belusov, Belusov Jabotinsky. Uh, shockingly named after Belusov and Jabotinsky. And that sounds like a little on the nose <coughs> <is a> description. <laughs> yes. And it's um, a series of chemicals that yeah. you mix. Mm -hmm. And if you leave them long enough, they arrange themselves in amazing shapes and forms, which any religious person would say, you see, there's proof of God. No monkey could have created this randomly. Mm. Of course, there's a famous um, argument that if you put an army of monkeys for eternity mm. with typewriters, one of them will produce Shakespeare mm -hmm. or the Bible. Mm. That's, of course, not true. But what is true, given enough um, raw materials in highly structured, specific environments and so on, you will come up with amazing complexity. Mm. Complexity uh, is what we call an emergent phenomenon. It's an epiphenomenon. Mm. It's, uh, it, it's not in anything. If you take hydrogen, if you take oxygen, there's no complexity there. Mm. You put them together, you get water. That's complex. Mm. Water is one of the most complex substances in the world. Mm. It's so complex that there are like huge volumes of, because it has surface tension. It, it freezes in the wrong temperature. It's mm. amazing substance. But it's comprised of, the, of one of the most basic, the most basic substance, mm. hydrogen. And a little, not so much basic. Mm -hmm. By the way, oxygen technically is a poison. It's toxic. Mm -hmm. So if you take a toxic material with the most basic material, put them together, you get the stuff of life. Mm -hmm. There's no life without water. Yeah. Even you are composed of 60 to 68% water. Even me. Even you. You have so many muscles, but still <laughs> you are 60%, 68% water. So this is ignorance, simply. You don't know enough. So when you don't know enough, you look and you make analogies from your very limited daily experience. You see uh, something structured, complex. Yes, come on. This could have never. Much better argument. Much better argument is how could things have co-appeared? It's called co-evolution. How could things co-appear? For example, in the same organism, you have process one and process two. But process one depends on process two. Process two depends on process one. Right. So, process one could not have arisen without process two, but process two could never have arisen without process one. This is called coevolution. Right. How could this have happened? Mm. I mean, one of them must have preceded the other, or both. Mm. Now, for both to have occurred, to have happened spontaneously, that begins to be a problem. So, coevolution presents a serious challenge. But still, we know how to explain it perfectly. Mm. And all these arguments are actually disguised creations. There must be a creator. There must be. What is a creator? Covert, small. I mean, he's like, it's a conspiracy theory. Yeah. Creationism is a conspiracy theory. There was a conspiracy between God and himself, and, and he made the vote. Mm. You know. So the Wizard of Oz creeping behind the curtain, making things happen. It's the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Wizard of Oz. When you read literature, good literature captures archetypes. Mm. It's the Wizard of Oz. Mm. I mean, uh, Dorothy. Tornado, Kansas, and so on and so forth. And finally, she, when she opens a curtain, mm. everything that has happened in her universe, the Witch of the North, the Witch of the South, I mean, you name it, everything, mm. is actually a tiny midget, I don't want to say, reminds me of who, who is pulling, pulling, <laughs> pulling levers and pushing buttons. And, and he's very terrified, by the way. He's like, oh, oh, oh. Don't look at me, don't look, don't look at me. me, and so on. So this is the Wizard of Oz uh, fallacy. Yeah. That, like, if there is complexity, there must be a Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in, uh, in Bounds uh, books, maybe, Frank Bounds, mm -hmm. 
but <laughs> science is a bit more complex. You've answered a couple of questions that I remember being positive. There was a, there was a bunch of books in the 80s. Uh, one of them was Lyle Watson, uh, Lifetide, mm -hmm. asking questions like this. This couldn't possibly be the case, evolution, two pieces coming. But now it's all... It's all carried forward by mainstream science, and they go, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Coevolution is explained, in my view, adequately by mainstream science. I have one more question for you. The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, from the point of view of historical hypotheses, do you, have you ever heard of any alternative theories of history, for example, um, advanced technology in 10,000, 20,000 years ago, anything like that that has ever caught your eye that you, feel, that you have thought, yes, this is a possibility, I'm open to that? My good uh, school friend, uh, von Däniken, <laughs> von Däniken wrote a series of books, very popular at the time, in the 60s, about uh, astronauts who yeah, yeah. landed on Earth, engineered everything. Ancient astronauts. And he found batteries in Iraq, with yes, yeah. all kinds of things. And so. so first of all, yes, there are definitely uh, quite a, I mean, thousands of cases where um, things that sh anachronistic mm. things that belong I mean like batteries in Iraq that's mm. a true case I mean, you think that's a, is, is that known as a real thing yeah absolutely it's a oh, true okay. case but it's not batteries right what matters is not the technology but it's context sure I mean you can take two buckets and connect them with a wire and suddenly there'll be electricity no one will say the the ancient Hebrews invented electricity yeah, yeah. you know yeah. actually if you look at the design of the Ark of the Covenant mm. The, the cupboard where the Ten Commandments were placed, mm -hmm. it's, it's an electric circuit. Right. Total electric circuit. Okay. And it was reconstructed, and it, it, so it's, in the Bible it says that a guy touched it and was electrocuted, died. So would you say the, the Hebrews knew about electricity? No. They joined together several woods. And these woods created, uh, and this wow, well, great! I mean, this is working. I mean, it's touching. It's dead. It, same with this battery. Actually, it's uh, the battery is this size, but it's, it's yeah. like they, someone stuck something in something. And, ooh, what a gimmick! What yeah. a, okay. It's more like a magician show. Okay. So, technology is never the invention, mm. which is, by the way, a serious mistake mistake of the past 20, 30 years. Mm. The emphasis in today's world is on in the invention, mm -hmm. not on the context. Right. And the result? Social media. Okay. The invention. There is a cult of invention. Mm. We must invent. We must innovate. We mu and we ignore the context. Mm. We ignore social context, cultural context, mm. psychological mm. context, and so on. So, the same with your question. Mm. Yes, of course, there are amazing things here there that mm. correspond to batteries and I don't know what. But there were no batteries. For, for a battery to be battery, you need to have a concept of a device with, with two, with these plugs and that plug. You need a whole, there's a whole universe mm. of, a whole contextual universe, yeah. which makes this object a battery. Yeah, and they were lacking. And they didn't have this, of course. Yeah. And that's a mistake. Mm. But yes, of course, there were such things. Now, history has alternative hypotheses. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, between 1968 and... 2006, I think. There was a guy who came up with a series of books called Black Athena. Mm -hmm. He claimed that Greek culture, ancient Greek culture, was not actually ancient or Greek. Uh, well, it was ancient, but not Greek. Mm -hmm. He said they took all their culture from Egypt mm -hmm. and Phoenic Phoenicia. Mm -hmm. So Phoenician, it was Phoenician and Egyptian. Mm -hmm. so. By the way, super convincing books, in yeah. my view. Oh, okay. Very convincing. I read all three. Really? I mean, each one is like 700 pages. It's stunning. It's very convincing. Mm -hmm. So he said, uh, you see, what you call Greek culture, because um, Greeks and Europeans by extension, European mm -hmm. Union especially, they say, well, the cradle of, civili of civilization, mm -hmm. the cradle of democracy, every cradles, they were all infants, you know, infantile. <laughs> <culture. laughs> they all in cradles. Yeah. So the cradle of this and cradle of this, modern science started here, philosophy started here, Aristoteles, his wife, I mean, mm -hmm. this kind of thing. He says, no one is denying, he says, that Aristotle is this, that. But he got his knowledge from Egypt. Right. He says, it all came from Egypt and Phoenicia. And that's called the Black Athena okay. variant. Now that's, you could say, maybe a conspiracy theory, but no, it's a hypothesis of history. Legitimate hypothesis, mm. widely debated, and, mm. and so on. So, so history has many layers. Okay. Many, many layers. Mm. Now, some conspiracy theories are proven later not to have been conspiracy theories, even in history. So, for example, when... Hitler invaded Poland. Mm. He said that a group of Polish um, army mm. uh, soldiers mm -hmm. 
attacked a radio unit, a German radio unit across the border mm -hmm. of Germany. Immediately the West said, this is fabrication, this is this, these are not real Poles, they are Germans dressed in Polish uniform, pa 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 pa. And everyone says conspiracy theory, come on. The West is propaganda. I mean, they're just, they just pro propagandizing. Mm. The truth is that probably the Poles went crazy or because. But today we know it's true. <clears throat> the Germans took a group of prisoners, executed them, mm -hmm. dressed them up in Polish uniforms. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and these so-called, <laughs> and spread them <laughs> among oh, the... Okay. So yeah. it's a, it was a black flag operation. So okay. today we know it's true. Mm -hmm. Of course, the grandest conspiracy of the mother of all conspiracies has mm. proven to be true, and that's the Holocaust. Mm. The Holocaust was considered for a very long time a conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. I mean, you find correspondence in the British Foreign Office, mm. Churchill, yeah. including yeah. Roosevelt, yeah. saying, listen, um, yeah, they hate the Jews. Mm. Who would not hate the Jews? I'm not, I'm ki I'm not kidding you. They hate the Jews, but it's understandable. You know, <clears throat> I don't want to express my opinion, but... So they hate the Jews, but who would not hate the Jews? And this exaggeration is that they are killing them in camps. I mean, give me a break. This is Jewish propaganda. Mm. Jews were saying this is Jewish propaganda mm. in America. Yeah. Everyone believes it's a conspiracy invented by the Jews to discredit the Germans and mm. so on and so forth until in 1944, the first Russian units entered uh, Mauthausen and mm. um, Birkenau and so on, discovered that the wildest variant of this conspiracy theory was not 0.001% of reality. Mm. Sometimes reality validates a conspiracy theory and makes yes. it writ large, yeah. you know, makes, ex makes it explode. Yeah. So. Well, I think we've pretty much sorted all that out there. I don't think anybody should have any more questions about That you're this. stopping this interview is a conspiracy. You know I have a lot more to say. You're suppressing my speech. <laughs> my earpiece. And I'm sure... And my five just told Yes, me I'm time. sure that you've been instructed by outside small forces who are an enemy to my message. I know the truth. He's being deplatformed, silenced. Deplatformed, silenced, like Alex Jones. I, I know the truth. If you want to know the truth, go to my channel. Not to his channel. To my channel, you will see the truth. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Cheers.